good morning. My name is Thomas Bowles. I'm the uh, managing director for the DIA in the European, Middle East and Africa region. And I'm uh, joined here by uh, Dr. Howard Chazen from the generics office of the FDA, who uh, just finished the session on uh, generics, yes. right? Yes. And um, what we were just discussing, this is actually, this was the first dedicated session on generics for the DIA, so that also um, really signifies the importance of this, this class of drugs. So I was going to ask some, some questions about the session and then, then we can maybe take it from there, right? right. Um, so first of all, maybe you, for those who didn't attend, although you, we had a, or you had a really good turnout of over 100 people, yes. um, why don't you tell us a little bit of what the session covered? Well, the session is, uh, again, a first for DIA. It was about um, the fact that generic drugs have their own um, formulation concerns and issues that relate to safety. So it, the safety, though, is not about the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Yeah. It's what makes the generic a little different. Yeah. So there are perceptions that generics aren't as good as brands or yeah, don't, uh, don't uh, act as well as brand. Yeah. And so we're trying to get past that misperception. Yeah. So the session not only talked about generic drugs and our uh, the FDA industries and academic perspectives, but also about the misperceptions of brands versus generic yeah. drugs. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I participate in part of the session, so on this, I just had a question like, generics are actually around for quite a while, right? Why are we talking this still after so long about, um, with generics on the market, things like perceptions and so on? I, I saw some data that it shifts, but it seems right. to shift quite so uh, slowly. Well, because a lot of advertising that happens with the brand sets people's expectation that brand is better. Yeah. If I see it in a magazine, if I see it on TV, it must be better. So I think the idea here is that generics have always saved people money yep. and they pick them up and they've used them and they're commonly used, but then sometimes they hear, oh, the brand's better, or oh, my doctor will only give me brand. And yep. so a misperception happens where suddenly maybe people feel, oh, maybe that generic isn't working as well, yes. or it, uh, it's a lot cheaper, is it, is it this less expensive, yeah. is it made cheaper? Yeah. So all these questions the public starts to raise in their own minds. So the point is we always focus here at DAA about you know, development of products and drug development through phase one, two, three studies, but we haven't really focused in on what happens to the life cycle of a product. You know, as the brand goes away and the generic drugs start to increase in the market, more and more people will use generics commonly, but, yes. but sometimes there'll be questions raised and respect yeah. their concerns. Perceptions are changing, though, yes, yes, over many uh, years, but they're definitely. still not complete. And as you heard from Dr. Kesselheim's um, session, it's a lot of it's about the physician, too. Yeah, that was quite surprising, because you would uh, imagine that the patient perhaps is not as knowledgeable around this, and therefore issues like perception are quite, you know, can influence. You would have expected physician, being a trained physician, would know about medicines, and it's quite surprising that even in that sort of, let's say, educated stakeholder category, the issue of perception, and there was still like a third, I seem to remember, of all physicians that that, um, that believe that, that generics are of a lower quality than, than the, the originator. Well, if you think about it, if physicians are exposed to the, uh, the also the advertising, the journals, uh, meetings, and they get used to brand names yes. and not the generic name. Yeah. And they write their prescription and then the patient leaves. Yeah. And then suddenly the patient's at the pharmacy and realizes that new drug is $300 for the month. And they say, I can't afford that, so you yeah. don't get it. Yeah. Well, the physician is, in, is disconnected from the patient's economics. And that's another issue that physicians may not be aware. Uh, one of our questioners at the end said, you know, in medical school, we don't have much pharmacology exp uh, um, treatment um, education. And we don't think about these kinds of things as physicians when we're writing scripts. We just think there's a problem, here's the therapy, write for it, and I'll be done. Yeah. But again, the economic issues never play. Yeah. And so you see the patient the next month and you say, well, how did you do on that new med? And they say, I never got it. Yeah, and you yeah. say, why? And they say, because it was $400. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so I can't afford that yeah. new medicine. Yeah. So that's part of the problem that we have to close that gap between physicians and patients and what they're sort of handling when they end up trying to pay for that kind of medication. So apart from the sort of perception challenges that that's, I think were quite clearly laid out, what are sort of other other topics in the generic development bringing to market that occupy you from the FDA, other 
I don't know, I'm just throwing this out, ethical issues or other issues that, that, you, you, that are important for, for you to look at as, a, as an agency? Well, my group focuses on safety and surveillance, but yeah. also we're thinking about how we can try to get at these questions through research. Okay. Like, could we test patients and blind them to brand versus generic to see if these complaints are really true? Or are they just perceptions? Yeah. Because if they're just perceptions of, we can focus on that and try to help that with messaging. Yes. But if it's truly something wrong with a particular brand, I mean, it's regular generic product that's replaced the brand, then we like to fix that. Yeah. We like to correct it so that the brand and generic are substitutable. Yeah, how, how would you do that? Would you do that in clinical trials? Well, one, one area in the Office of Generic Drugs, we have the Office of Research Standards, has a methodology for putting out grants and um, contracts to set up actually uh, formal studies, either looking at uh, retrospective cohort studies through databases yeah. or prospective you know, parallel or crossover clinical trials yeah. to try to address these. Yeah. And what? So. May, yeah, no, but may, maybe this, maybe it's a bit of a provocative question, right? But, uh, what, what if you would do that and differences would come out? Would that not have a major impact on the whole perception paradigm of generics being sort of bi equivalent to the originator drug, etc.? And that because now there is. The discussion focuses very much on, well, you know, they should be considered the same. And if, if people feel they're not the same, this is more a perception issue. But if you would get that based on real data, what would that mean for the genetic drug as a, as a class? Well I, well, I think the idea is to confirm what we already know. Okay. We know that generic drugs should be pharmaceutically equivalent, that's yeah. the chemistry, bioequivalent through testing, and they should be substitutable. They're not identical, they're substitutable because there are some allowable differences. If we find a generic that isn't acting substitutable and is what we call therapeutically inequivalent, yeah. we need to make sure that's not available as a substitute for the brand because it's not reaching all the criteria necessary for approval anymore. Sometimes that can happen when, let's say, a generic product gets on the market and suddenly gets the uptakes very fast and then the, maybe the manufacturer has not being able to scale it up properly. And they wouldn't know until it got out to a broader market and then there was a problem. Yeah. Or the bigger problem with, you know, is the bottle, the packaging correct? Is the injector correct? Yes. The device that may come along. Yeah. We're very concerned about the newer products coming down the line that are complex, yes. that may be complexly made or, or a drug device combination yes. that might be confusing if you switch from the brand to the generic, since it looks a little different, feels a little different, yes. would it be used a little differently? Yeah. Or, and also off-label use. If you think about it, a broader population is being exposed. You have a brand product, very carefully evaluated in a, in a population, a patient population. It's probably too expensive for most uh, patients to use. Then the price drops dramatically. A broader population, sicker, yeah. on more medications is using it. And that's a whole different paradigm that we'd like to know more about. Yeah. So that's some of the challenges that face generic drug uptake. But yeah, you mentioned the word uptake, and I come from Europe, and as we, before the interview, we said, I'm not an expert in the generic market as, as, as you are, but um, I find it quite interesting to see that here, indeed, the discussion seems to focus much more actually on sort of let's say, the regulatory pathway and, and safety issues rather than uptake, because there was also another st statistic that came out in one of the presentation that is sort of like 90% of all prescribed drugs in, uh, in the US are actually generics and they save the system. What was it, one trillion between 2002 and two, yeah, something like that. So if I, with my European mind and have in Europe, we have much more of an issue of, um, of uptake, right? There are really some countries that have a really good uptake of generic and some countries that don't have it. And some of it is related to uh, to, um, to perception, frankly speaking. Um, but um, what's, what's your view on, on um, in the US in, in terms of the, the uptake discussion? Is that the 90%, for example? Is that that's the sort of target area? So well, what the US has that might be different is that sort of the default is at pharmacies fill with a generic, yeah. unless there's no one that's not available. But the doctor has to write in the prescription, do not substitute, yes. to in order for the brand name only. Okay. So, most physicians are not writing those that down on the prescription, so the pharmacist is dispensing a generic. Yeah. So the generic uptake is kind of automatic. 
um, here. You, there's really not much choice unless you're on a particular product. Like we mentioned, ep anti-epileptics was for a while controversial about people not using generic anti-epileptics. But perspectives are changing, and that's why it's up to 90%. The other 10% are drugs that have probably have no generic. Yeah. And then, of course, new products that come on the market, yeah. new medical, new chemical entities, yeah. for a while, because of exclusivity, they're not going to have a generic. Sure. So we'll never get to 100%. Yeah. No, no, that's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. Can I maybe switch to maybe some sure. of the stakeholders, right? Because this was also, so in your session, it's very much, let's call it industry and regulator or agency. What's your views on, on the involvement of patient groups? I, I, on some of the slides, they were mentioned the role of patients, for example, in adherence. Right. So what, but also maybe for, for you as an agency, what, what, what do you see the role is of, um, of patient, maybe more patient groups rather than individual patients? Well, I think sometimes patient groups have contacted FDA directly, okay. or they've sent their complaints through others, or through, we get letters, congressmen may, may write in. Um, there are various groups that look out for medical safety, and they will send things in. There's something called citizens' petitions. They'll be written to FDA saying, you shouldn't approve that product because of the following concerns we have, and they all have to be answered uh, before the drugs are approved. So there's a lot of mechanisms to hear from the public, yeah. and that's what we're here for. We're here for public health. Sure. You know, I'm not here personally to approve more new, more drugs. I'm here to you know help the public. Yeah, that's yeah. why I'm in public service. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I'm at FDA. Okay. So, very that's, very so that's so that's and the bottom line is, we'd like patients to get clear instructions. We'd like them to not fall into the trap of this misperception issue. Yes. We'd like to re-educate yeah. that generic drugs are safe and effective, just like the brand. Okay. Um, but that's going to take some time because people believe what they believe. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know. Maybe as a last question, like what, what, what? Also, again, for those who didn't attend, what would be the sort of I don't know one, two, three key messages that you want people that watch this video to take away? Well, I want people to know that generic drugs are safe and effective. They're substituted for the, for the brand, and then FDA really works hard. And we don't just you know people may mis misperceive FDA as you know regulatory agency that just you know, is approving products and, and not thinking much about them after they're approved. But yeah. I have a feeling, well, we sh you should, we should, people should know that FDA spends a lot of effort in making sure that drugs continue to be safe on the market. Yeah. They do a lot of surveillance, there's a lot of cross-center talk, a lot of uh, multi-disciplines are working on this pro problem all the time. And we want to reassure the public that this is our job. Again, we're here for public safety. We're here for, for them. And um, that would be the, probably the final thing I'd like to say. Okay, very good. Thank very well, much. thank you very much, Dr. Sad. As I said, it was uh, thank, you very much. thank you for the interview. And uh, hopefully next year we have another session yes, on Unerics, for sure. <laughs> okay, thanks.